Hi, I'm Michelle Velberg. I'm an Icon Ambassador for Canada. I'm also a Canadian Geographic Photographer in Residence, and I'm a lover of birds. And chances are you're probably into bird photography or wildlife photography if you're tuning in tonight. Um, I have an absolute love and fascination for these little critters that fly around us, and uh, I can't wait to share some of my background some of the work that I've done around my own backyard, especially with COVID, and talk about some of the aspects that I work on with focusing and light and interaction and emotion. So thanks for joining in and I'll look forward to chatting with you uh, throughout the presentation as well and offering any uh, ways that I can answer any questions that you might have. And, and I know the Nikon folks are with me here, so um, they're happy to help as well with any equipment information or any technical information that you might have. So let's dive into the right light and perfect flight. So I'll just give you a little bit of a background with what's in my think tank camera bay. Uh, presently, I'm shooting with, a, a, with three cameras. I typically go out with a Z7 or a Z7, sorry, I was part of the Nikon launch, so I say Z often, uh, the 6.2 and the 7.2. I go between the 6.2 and 7.2. Lately, I've been heading a little bit more into the 7.2, but anyway, I, I use all three and all three have different purposes and we'll, we'll talk through that as we go through the presentation. So for my F-mount lenses, I have a 105, which I absolutely love. I'm in my studio. That's what I love. Absolutely. I it barely take it off. I did have the 85 millimeter or I do have the 85 millimeter. But once I picked up the 105 again with the FTZ adapter um, and having absolutely no image quality loss or functionality loss, it's really hard to go. It's hard to get that out of my hands again. And that's typically what I do with my lenses. And I get into one specific lens and I really dive deep into it. I'm not sure if you guys do that too, but uh, I well, you, you can really explore and, and work that that lens and, and become very, very familiar with it. I used to like to say it's like going to the driving range with a huge bucket and just hitting the driver or hitting that club that, that you aren't so good at um, or that you need improvement on. You hit a full bucket, it's kind of the same thing, but just in a little bit different venue, obviously. Um, and uh, I absolutely, my go-to for sure wildlife lens is the 500 millimeter PF. That has been transforming uh, the way that I shoot in, in my kayak and, and having the versatility and uh, you know, it's just so light and, and fast, sharp. It's just an extraordinary piece of equipment. So I also get to shoot sometimes with the 800 millimeter and as well, that takes a little bit more commitment as far as, you know, if you, well, you have, need stability like a tripod or shooting out of your car, whatever it might be. So it takes a little bit more commitment, but I certainly know that lately I have been using a lot of the 800 millimeter for certain projects that I've been doing and it has been extraordinary for that capability. I use a two times extender as well for both the 500 and the 800 millimeter. I have great success with it. And I know it, felt, it defaults down to F11. Um, you know, that means a, a little bit higher ISO. Um, if you're shooting birds in flight, you need a fast shutter speed. So, you know, it comes with its challenges, let's just say, but I've had huge successes with it. And I'm gonna be showing you those images soon. I just picked up the 50 millimeter um, micro lens. I haven't had a 50 millimeter in a very, very long time. I think back in my FM days, I don't know. I just have never used a 50 millimeter in the last number of years, which is a long time. And um, I'm absolutely loving it. I love having um, that size lens for going into the boat or or for doing more fun stuff um, with family, but also just going into that micro world and the macro world of those tiny little critters and, and just playing around. And the, the clarity and the sharpness of this lens is just absolutely outstanding. I'm interested in trying the 105 as well, the micro just released, but um, for now, I've, I'm really happy to add the 50 millimeter back into my camera bag. As I said, I'll use the 85 millimeter for some portraits if I want to have a little bit more room, maybe if there's a group. And then, of course, if for landscapes, the 14 to 24, all the set S series lens, the 24 to the 70 and the uh, 70 to 200. Again, I have the two times extender for the 70 to 200. So often 
the uh, 72 or the 62 will have the 70 to 200 with the two times on. Um, I had the 1.4, but I tend to uh, to go for the two times if I if I if I'm going to use an extender. It's just the way that that I work. And you know, just keeping in mind that it's whatever works for you. Carrying three cameras is a commitment. It's crazy, um, but this is what I do for a living, and this is where you know I I have to invest my 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 dollars and my um, you know it, for my whether I'm in the studio or whether I'm in, in wildlife, it's so important. And it's just been transforming to be full on mirrorless. And since the launch at two and a half or is it three years ago now, I guess. Oh my goodness. Um, you know, I haven't, I haven't looked back and I sold my D50 and my D5 and I have been full on uh, embracing mirrorless and absolutely loving every aspect of the mirrorless camera. So just, I know you, if you're tuning in, you probably know all this, maybe you're beginning it, wherever it is that you are in your in your career or in your love and passion for photography. Um, you know, it's always, these things are really, really important to just be mindful of and, and remember, and some might trigger something for you. I mean, you're like, yeah, yeah, I know. But really, I think, you know, if, if you're gonna invest in a camera, uh, would ever make a model, but if you know if you're going to go into the higher level DSLRs or mirrorless now, you really have to know your camera. And just because you've got an outstanding camera and you're seeing all your exposure live and you have all this capability, you just really, really got to know your camera inside and out. And it's not reading a manual; it's going out and and shooting with it and really diving deep. And if you're new into the mirrorless or you're moving into the mirrorless, I found that that was really important for me to just absorb myself fully into the system because it is a little bit different and there were capabilities that i'm still learning about and i'm still trying to um, master so no matter what you have to know your camera and you have to know how your iso your shutter and your aperture are all working together and um you know getting off of that that green button and and uh you know even the aperture shutter priority is great your auto iso is a, is a great opportunity but you know we have the capability now you know obviously with with mirrorless and dslr just to look at your images that you're capturing on the back so once you start to play around with with those three elements that all react together and act together um it's you know you start to understand and really see how you can improve your your work and i you know going out early and, and late in the day most times it's easy for people to go out late in the day but you know i'm out 4 4 30 in the morning before the sun rises and i'm on the lake and i'm out shooting and sometimes it requires getting out of bed when you really really don't want to and when you're when you're doing this for yourself mostly it's hard because it's so easy to just roll over especially if you had a bad night's sleep but i've never been disappointed when i've been on the lake um that early in the morning or else out in in nature it's a it's an amazing opportunity to see wildlife and behavior but also just to be in nature and really absorb it understanding composition and how it works to improve your images i'm constantly looking at instagram and other people's work for inspiration um you know trying to improve my my work all the time how i can make it different um you know paying attention to your background and your foreground is is something that i've started to do mostly with my background i'm not really a foreground shooter sometimes i am but um you know really how your background is is interacting with your subject and how you can enhance the background to to make your subject stand out that much more or just enhance your image altogether I know you probably know all this, but again, it's just, you know, it's just when you're going out, maybe that's all you do. You know, maybe the next time you go out and shoot, if you want to challenge yourself, which I often do is, you know, go out and, and focus right on your background. And, and that's all you're looking at. Uh, that's what I do a lot of times with my, with my lenses as well. I'll just take one camera out and say, okay, I've got the 14 to 24 and that's all I'm going to shoot with today or else I'll take out just my 500 and not have the option to go to a wider lens and see how you can react and, and use your, your equipment that you're, you know, committed to for that shoot. And it really changes the way that you think and, and, you know, the way that you might approach your subject changing and working your vantage point your perspective and and of course you know going up or down and i'm oftentimes lying on the ground or or going up high or just changing the way like you can change six inches and it can make a difference in your in your image 
creating emotional impact. And we'll go through that in, in this presentation as well. I mean, that's just, it goes with it, you know, and choosing those images and that interaction with the animals that are going to uh, have more of an impact for your viewers. And, and again, practice, practice, practice all the time. I do it all. I, and I have improved so much in the last uh, year just because I have really absorbed myself. I've always shot every day I photograph either in the studio or out. Um, but now I'm just like, all the time so practice 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 continuing your education and you know there's so much online content that's what you're doing here tonight um you know you're you're uh learning from others and i'm continuously and i was a student this year in a santa fe workshop with sarah lean and bill Maher, and that changed my perspective for sure uh, post processing, obviously, knowing some whatever post production, you know, if you use some Photoshop or Lightroom or um, Capture or, you know, the Nikon software, which is also a fantastic, um, you know, just really know uh, how to post process your image. It goes beyond just the click. Get out of your comfort zone, which I often do, and take the chances, make mistakes, and be patient. I mean, those are those are the elements that we all know, but you know, things that I think uh, if we continuously think about or we concentrate on one of them, it can just help build our 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 work, um, build our work up, and make us better photographers. So. Bird photography has been in my life for a long time. My parents were big birders. They traveled the world uh, photographing birds. They would, everywhere they went, they um, went to, with the intention of, of bird watching. And they were the ones who interested me in nature and paying attention to what's around us and how to see and not look, but how to really, really see. My father was an eye doctor, funny enough, and uh, he's no longer with us, but um, my parents, you know, instilled, um, that in all of us, my sisters and I, and and also my my son, you know, and took him out bird watching at a very young age, and always had him out and interested. And now he's an amazing spotter. So now I've got an awesome spotter. He doesn't take many pictures, if at all, but he did before. But now, you know, he's always spotting and looking out for things for me. So it comes in handy when you engage your kids, right, uh, into um, into your work and get them interested. And, and then it's a family affair. You know, you can enjoy it together. So I do have this body blind I uh, bought from Lenscoat. And uh, in the springtime, I will photograph wildlife, um, sometimes fox and what other critters I can find. Um, and here I'm with the tripod and the 800 millimeter and I was actually photographing fox and I will actually photograph birds and hummingbirds and uh, it's amazing uh, the opportunities that you get when you're in a full blind. You can have the stand up ones, whatever it is, whatever way that you can hide away from the animals, it's better because then you have more opportunity of, of seeing their seeing their behavior. As I mentioned, oftentimes I'm on the ground. Uh, I will, I love photographing in snow and rain. When everybody's running in, I'm usually running out. Uh, it takes a lot of commitment and also, you know, making sure that you're not only kept dry and warm and, uh, but your equipment is as well. So I use the Think Tank products. Um, the hydrophobia is, you know, in extreme, you know, full day rain, uh, gear. It's really important to keep your cameras dry. So I do that. I also use the lens coat and, um, you know, they're really, they're really helpful. And it's important, like I said, not only to keep yourself dry with good Gore-Tex, but uh, that you're keeping your camera equipment dry as well, obviously. Um, you know, again, with the 800 millimeter, as I mentioned, it takes a little bit of commitment. You have to have the tripod, you have to have the stability in order to, you know, to, to manage it. Um, so when you're traveling, it, it takes a little bit of extra money to put it onto the plane and carry on. And uh, that's why I like traveling with my family because then I have uh, instant porters. But um, anyway, that's not always the case. So it's making yourself look very small when you go to the airport, which is not easy when you're a photographer, right? Uh, I uh, invested in a couple of 512 gigs, um, which has really helped me this year with um, doing a lot of video work. I'm not sure how many of you are doing some video work, but I encourage all of you to switch that button to video if you haven't. It's so easy, especially with the mirrorless. And uh, I've been really, really 
uh, I was always a little hesitant using the 512 just because I thought it's going to be so much memory in one card and if something happens, but nothing ever happens. And and really, when you're shooting the 45 megapixels, you're bursting, you're doing bird photography, you're working out in the wild, um, having those big cards make a huge, huge difference. And of course, with the double slots with the 6.2 and the 7.2, having the SD card as backup has really helped a lot. And there's many times that I've taken a card out and then uh, to download it. And then all of a sudden I hear something and I grab my camera and I run out and I've left my XQD card or CFAST card in the cottage. And, you know, having that backup and that SD is really, really helpful for me. I only use it for overflow. I don't use it for, for backup. So I know that uh, for a lot of photographers, the backup was really important. So with the new cameras, having the double slot, it, it makes a huge difference and it saved me a couple of times. So I'll use bean bags. A lot of times I'll shoot from my car. I've spent this summer photographing and documenting this heron uh, rookery, blue heron rookery right from my car. And uh, I've gone out a couple of times, but most of it has been right from my vehicle and you know having bean bags. I my whole car is just filled. My back of my car is filled with um, from tripod heads to bean bags to dry bags and all kinds of covers. So if my car is an absolute disaster, which Jacob could probably attest to, but um, anyway, it leaves me uh, good and ready for anything to to happen. So a lot of a lot of my work, if you follow me on Instagram, uh, you'll see a lot of my work is done from my kayak. Uh, we have a, a cottage on Sherbet Lake, so I spend as much time as I can there. Especially during COVID, I've spent more time there than I have in in, in the 21 years that we've been on the lake. But I, I use a fishing kayak. It's a Jackson Kusa. HD and I feel that it's uh, very very stable and obviously I go out when it is not too bad. I will carry two to three cameras in my in my kayak. I know it's crazy. A lot of times people think that I'm absolutely out of my mind that I do this, but uh, anyway, I go out. I feel safe and comfortable with it, and I'm able to capture amazing, amazing images. And when you get out at four o'clock in the morning or 4.30 in the morning before the sun rises, this is what you get. I mean, you get the, the beautiful skies and the colors that you just can't manage uh, in any other time of the day. And, you know, the mist coming off of the lake and no matter where you are, even if it's, you know, I'm lucky enough, I have a cottage and I know how blessed I am. But, you know, even if you go to your local river or, or pond, you know, you get up at that time in the morning, you see all kinds of behavior. Sometimes you don't. I ha I, can't, I shouldn't say you, you don't always go out and see behavior, but you can see some pretty amazing light when you, when you do. This was actually end of the day. I went out, I was so excited that we had loons nesting in our bay this year. And, uh, and I went out one night and I knew that she was hatching very soon and I was photographing her, it was low light and then, you know, it was cloudy. And then all of a sudden when I was photographing her, the sun burst out uh, for a nanosecond and I was actually filming, which made it a beautiful video. Um, and then I switched off because I really wanted to capture the light. So oftentimes I will shoot right into the, into the low light. And it just, it softens things and it creates shadows and detail and um, a feeling that, that you can't get obviously in midday or even when it gets to be eight o'clock in the morning, it's the light's too high for me. So that low light is just extraordinary and soft. And sometimes this is the, um, the nest that I showed earlier with the, with the sunset. I went out the next morning and uh, sure enough, she, she had a, um, a chick born and waiting for the second one to come out. So if you followed me on Instagram, you may have seen the story, but if you haven't, you can always go back and look, but it was quite something and I'll, I'll dive a little bit into it, but I'm not going to share the whole thing because it's, I could be here for two hours you know, talking to you about my loon story this year. What's so interesting is, you know, going out into the elements and seeing uh, animals that you've spent a lot of time with over the years, like the 20, 21 years and, and seeing different kind of behavior. And it's really quite something um, to see how things change. And, you know, as video uh, or still storytellers, uh, we're visual storytellers, 
you know, we have an opportunity to share uh, behavior and scenes, uh, whether good or bad, you know, with experts, maybe with the science, you know, we can blend art and science and really learn from what it is that we're seeing. And it's important for us to share. And that's what's so great about Instagram and social media. But when I have spent a lot of time with, with this pair, you know, it's amazing how trusting they are. And, you know, they're my friends, you know, I feel part of their family. I feel like the godmother of the lake. <laughs> I know it's silly, but I'm sure all of anyone out there that has photographed a lot of nature, you feel a connection and, and with this pair. So I was so excited about them having uh, a nest in our in our bay to because last year they weren't they weren't successful but they have an element of trust with me that they allow me into a, a their private space and to watch their behavior and this is when it's raining and like I said I'll go out in any in any except for when it's thunder and lightning okay I will not go out when it's thunder and lightning I hate thunder and lightning but um, you know rain can add a, a really cool element to your images as well. I, there's just something incredible, right? When you think that you can spend time and witness this. Um, I, I always feel blessed and, and honored as I'm sure, I'm sure you do as well. Um, in the early morning hours too, and the way that the light plays on the, on the water. Um, and I liked that I didn't have, you know, the face. I had the loon turning to the left but uh, this one I love just because uh, the focus is primarily on the on the chicks and and maybe the mystery of of the parent looking straight ahead. But the way that the light was playing on the lake created this beautiful uh, greeny tone to it. And again, um, you know, with the 500 millimeters, often I'll have the two times on. Um, I was shooting with the 200 to 500, which is an awesome lens as well. And it allows you to get back a little bit once you're committed to the 500 or even the 800, but this isn't my kayak. I don't take the 800 out in my kayak. Um, you know, once you're committed to the 500, then you kind of play with that, with that focal length and, and having that limitation isn't, isn't a bad thing. And I never feel like I have too much lens. If anything, I feel that I've, I'm always wanting more. But again, we're all so different in the way that we work. So it's it's whatever works for you is what is most important. And that's something to always remember. So uh, when the sun starts to go up, I oftentimes I'll switch to the 7.2 in the early, early. If I'm shooting, especially with the 500, the two times, I'll put the 6.2 on. Um, and if I have the two times extender on, then I'm using the 6.2 for not only the, the frame rate, but also for the ISO capability, even though the 7.2 is pretty darn good too. Um, but I tend to, to gravitate now towards the 7.2 just because of, um, of the megapixels. I'm just absolutely loving it. And again, it all depends on, on the day. It depends on the morning. As you can see, all, oh, I don't have it there. Um, I'll take all the ISO that I, I can get um, in the fastest shutter speed. So I'm working down for my ISO. I do not shoot in auto ISO, preferably. I would rather make the decision. But again, I'm a manual shooter. I have been forever. And that's the way that I like to work. And I just, I'm trained, just I'm, I'm working my settings all the time. So if auto ISO works for you, great. And exposure compensation, great. Um, again, it's just, it's what, it's what works for you. Um, so I'm constantly changing from my ISO down to my shutter to my aperture. Often if I'm at, at the 500 and I'm early morning, if I don't have the extender on, I'll leave it at 5.6. But with the loons and the chicks, then I, I'd like a little bit more like F8 and even up to 11, because if the loons, uh, the chicks separate from the mom, it's nice to have um, them all in focus. And at 5.6, I find that if they're not on the same plane and they move uh, away from each other, then oftentimes you're either getting the chicks in focus or the parents in focus. And like this in particular, um, you know, it could have been that uh, the eye of the parent is in focus, um, but the the chick would have been slightly out. So having a little bit more aperture. So it's just constantly working those three elements together. And I think, you know, intuitively that it works for me. And if it doesn't, um, you know, if you're, you're, if you're trying to work through it and you're trying to capture the image, then it's most important that you are using those auto elements that you can still make the decisions because 
your camera's not going to know that you're shooting, you know, birds and you need a faster shutter speed. Um, it's going to know that you need a little bit more light. So, you know, you can set your your shutter speed and then allow the camera to make the choice with your either auto, your ISO or your aperture. So there's ways of, around it, but I, if you haven't been shooting manual, I, I highly recommend just going out and trying it and really working your camera, especially with mirrorless because you're changing your exposure on the light and you can see in that changing light how you can manipulate your image and your exposure to get exactly what it is that you want to get and maybe break the rules and yeah taking the chances and and you know working your camera to take advantage of of the changing light and that's one thing when you were are working early morning hours and the light is changing and it's it's moving up and you know you can be changing your position based on where the wildlife is so you know as the light is changing your exposure is changing and you know you can really start to work it in your in your favor and you know this shows you like the the trust that that this uh, this loon family has with me, you know, and and they'll come over and they'll leave me the chick and go off hunting, and it's like you know the chick is two days old, and and they'll leave me with the chick, and I'm like, no, don't leave, I don't want the responsibility of your chick, <laughs> don't leave me with. <laughs> anyway, um, it's pretty something. It's it's a it's a pretty special feeling to be that close. So this year. Um, I, I followed along this family coming off the nest. I, I documented the whole thing. I spent days. And then one morning I went out and the loons weren't um, with their chicks. And I saw some really weird behavior. And then the next morning I went out and I found the chick by itself. And uh, I helped guide it back to its mom because it was going in the complete opposite direction. And I'm just, this is a short little video clip just to share because I think it's really important as visual storytellers that we have that this element involved and and you know if you can you know it's part of the story and this chick is only eight days old actually and you know he was fishing and then you can get the little sound of of the chick as well um I'm gonna cry <laughs> I haven't looked at these since um since I saw this behavior so this is what was happening, you know, one, one morning I went out and, and, you know, the, there weren't two, two adults and two chicks, there were three adults and no chicks and watching this behavior was quite fascinating. Again, it's part of the story, you know, and, and that's one thing that I learned from my course is, is telling the story. And, and if you're able to document the same animals uh, over and over again, it's creating that content that can can really enhance your work and by telling by telling a story. So when I was watching that behavior, I decided that I needed to videotape it as well. And uh, so here you're seeing the the three loons interacting. And again, you know, it's it's part of the story and it's part of the visual that I'm able to share with with all of you tonight or going forward or just even with my family. So really really capturing that behavior in video as well as still is, is, is quite um, a gift. So sadly, I found the mom with the chick, one chick. And then the next morning I found um, an adult dead in our bay. And it was heartbreaking, you know, you've spend so much time with these animals and and I know it's nature and I have a soft heart and um you know I I just I I cried when I saw the dead loon and I only saw one chick so I I figured that maybe there was a territorial fight going on but we don't know right and and again is it a lure that he swallowed was he sick was he old we don't we don't know that story Perhaps because the other chick was not alive anymore. We never did see him again. Maybe he was defending his territory um, and they're violent, like incredibly violent. And of course, loons, we hear their haunting call and, you know, it's so Canadiana and it's, it's like when you're on a lake and you hear the sound of the call of the loon, you just, your, mel your heart melts and, uh, but they're very, very territorial and uh, protective. And, you know, this is behavior that I see often in August after the chicks have grown a bit. But now this is when, um, you know, we're seeing no chicks anymore. And I paddled out because I heard them and I was capturing um, these two just uh, a few days ago. 
in uh, with and so one of the important things that I I just want to go back to is you know using the 500 with the two times with the mirrorless, and in my kayak I'm able to stay low, I'm able to stay quiet in my kayak, and I'm also able to stay at a distance and keep quiet without the sound of a click. So the thousand millimeters allows me to stay at a at a good distance without interrupting. And that's most important, right, as wildlife photographers, that we don't want to be interrupting behavior and causing any disturbance with the animals. So uh, that's why I absolutely love the thousand millimeters. And and these were taken with it. I'm I'm getting sharp detail. I don't really find um, you know a, a change in the in the focus. Maybe it's a little bit small, a slower, um, and I'm constantly changing my focus modes as well. And that's the difference with the mirrorless for me with versus the D850 or the D5. I typically left my focus mode on on dynamic. With the mirrorless, I find that I'm constantly changing my focus modes. And now that they have animal eye detect, um, it works well with the with the uh, some animals with dogs especially, um, but it worked with fox and it worked with the with the wolves. Um, I haven't used the new animal I detect with the bears, but you know getting there and uh, anyway it's it's really quite interesting to to be using those focus modes depending on what it is that you're photographing. You know whether it's birds or a large animal. I oftentimes will use the wide area small, and uh, I find that that works well for me. Sometimes if it's a flock, I'll use, you know, the full on um, auto aerial autofocus. And it, again, it depends on the contrast. It depends on the, the, the system I'm using. It depends on the lens, if I'm using the two times extender, and what uh, the distance is from you to the birds and what the background is. There's all kinds of elements. So really taking your camera out and understanding how those focus systems are going to work for you is really, really important. Here's the series I did last year. I didn't expect this. This was in August. I was photographing. I wasn't having huge success. And then next thing you knew, I had two loons jumping out of the water. Um, and I thought they were fishing at first, but then I realizing that they were in a full on territorial fight. And I just fired off as many images that I could. And uh, and I had no concept of really what was going on. This was again with the 502 times extender. Um, it was, you know, the light was obviously getting up higher in the day, but I had no idea until I saw the stills exactly what was going on, including, you know, the violence and, and the wrapping around the neck of the beak. I mean, it was just crazy to see, to see all these. Look at that. Isn't that crazy? Full on beak. Um, they did survive, like they ended up, you know, uh, following each other down the, down the lake. So, um. It, it, they did. They didn't kill each other, but it was amazing to see this. Even the tongue sticking out. It was crazy, crazy. So you just never know. So when I'm not photographing loons, I, I have uh, we have a lot of blue herons on our on our lake, and I have in particular a friend. I call him Harry, and he flies over me and he squawks, and then he's like, "Forget the loons, come and photograph me." So he performs quite nicely for me, and often you know you'll see a blue heron in at a distance and then he'll run off you know or fly off not run off fly off um as you approach and they're very skittish but this guy you know he landed right in the middle of the lake in the water beautiful foggy morning um never seen a, a heron land in the middle of the water um just sat there looked around and and it was like he was coming over to say hello now he fishes like he actually lands in the water, grabs a fish, and will either eat it and then fly away with it. Um, I've never, again, we've never seen this. And it's just quite interesting behavior that uh, after all these years on the lake and and then seeing this, and I would go paddle back and I'd tell my husband, I was like, the balloon landed on the water. He actually fished right out of the middle of the lake and then took off with it. It's crazy. And even here, you can see first thing in the morning, he's actually running on the water. Uh, pretty cool when they'll do it and when they'll do it in, in such close proximity to you as well. He's a very prolific hunter and he'll walk the shoreline when he's not landing in the middle of the lake. And, and again, with the thousand two and two times extender, I'm able to stay at a distance and just follow along and I'm not disturbing him and he's just following, grabbing small fish, big fish. He's grabbing frogs and even dragonflies off of, off of the trees. In particular, I think this is one of my favorite from that series of walking along the shoreline and just capturing that eye just before before it goes in to, to capture the, the fish. I had the whole series, but uh, I also got this on video too. So that's pretty cool. 
so this was just on Sunday, like a, a few days ago. And, uh, my son was actually filming me and in my kayak and I caught sight of, of a blue heron and somebody made mention on Instagram, well, this must have taken hours for you to get. And I saw the blue heron actually where I found the, the dead loon and he had something big in his mouth. So I paddled over and of course he was very skittish with me coming close to him because he had food. And, uh, you know, I, I realized he had this big massive catfish in his mouth and he was trying to break it down and then he would put it in the water and he would pick it back up again. And, and then uh, he looked at me and he flew off. So he was in the bright, it was like two o'clock in the afternoon. So bright sunlight. And uh, it wasn't great shots by any means because there was grass, but he flew off into the shadow. And I was like, okay, so I, I worked my, uh, my shutter and my ISO. And, uh, and then I got into the shadow, which was way better lighting for me. And then and then he stood there, he broke it down a little bit again, and then he flew off. And I was like, oh my God, look at this. It's amazing. And again, I just took the chance. I had the thousand millimeters on, I had, a, I had the 500 with two times, and I just took a chance. And I had the wide area, small um, autofocus, back focus button I use as well. And I just followed him along. I had no idea what I got. But with one 400th of a second, I got movement in his wing. Um, you know, tack, sharp um, eye and with the catfish. So super excited to, to achieve this result. I make my husband go out and look for the green herons on the lake. And again, this is, I've added this in because I actually added in foreground and used, you know, as part of the elements of the, of the scene to create a little bit more interest than just the, the blue heron standing there. And I'm always looking for the behavior, right? And and uh, I just, I, this one cracks me up just because the way that he's moving and uh, his mouth and wide open, he's like, he's laughing and having a good chat. So I uh, had some hooded mergansers. I, this was taken with the 800 a few times and I was just on our landing. And again, just being wide eyed open, you know, con looking at, at the different, animals, birds that are coming into into the bay. This was in spring migration. We've never had the hooded mergansers, especially in our bay. So I was able to just sit there and just loved every second of it. And then he pulled out this massive crab. <laughs> I, just, I swim in these waters. So it's like, where did that come from? He didn't even dive down. He just put his head under the water and came out with this massive crab. Anyway, it's funny when you're seeing what's on top of the water, what they're bringing out, and you know that you swim in these waters. <laughs> um, followed these guys along, and and again, just took the chance, and and uh, you know, I they're very very skittish. I had the 500 with two times, and I just, you know, I went out in my kayak when they moved out, and and just stayed on them, and I knew they were gonna fly off, and and just took the chance, and that's the biggest thing, you know, not when you think that, oh, this is impossible to get, but just taking those chances and, and, uh, and working your camera and making it, making it happen. So you can see I was at a thousand ISO 1250th of a second. So I'll take as much speed as I can. And, and it's a pretty bright day. So you can see that, you know, I was obviously at F11 with the two times extender, but, um, with the thousand ISO, I was able to get 1250. We have eagles on our lake now, which maybe, you know, contributes to the lack of um, moon chip, maybe. Um, and, you know, again, just anticipating, waiting. I, I saw this uh, actually with my son who spotted the uh, eagle that flew off the tree um, and flew onto another tree away from where the nest was and said, he's got a fish. And then I made my husband and son wait in the boat with me for a good half hour because um, I knew he was going to bring this fish back to the nest, and um, and I was uh, I was just so I was so happy to see uh, that he he jumped off in the way that he did with the beautiful sky in the background and this massive massive pike. Again, I swim in these waters, <laughs> and uh, yeah, just again being in the right place at the right time, watching the nest. He was uh, flying off the nest, going to to catch fish. They're very active, obviously when they're nesting and they have two very large chicks that they have to feed a lot. Um, yeah, so again, a 1250th of a second from, and this wasn't from my kayak, this was from our boat. And an osprey and just being, a, a, you know, paddling in, having a morning that it was like, ah, not much happened, but I had a beautiful paddle and then came back, saw a white head on top of the tree. 
I focused up. It was an osprey. He flew off. So my kayak was facing forward. He flew off over top of me and I heard splash. So I'm facing this way and I'm hearing a splash behind me. And by the time I turned around, I got my kayak position. He flew off and I followed him though. And I was like, okay, I'll see where he lands. Maybe he'll land in a tree close by and I can paddle over to watch what, you know, his feed. And he circled around and he came back and he landed right on the tree that he flew off of and had his meal right in front of me. So I uh, got some really great slow mo of, of him feeding on the fish. And then the middle picture is when he, he was shaking off and he was ready to, to fly off. Um, Comrades, again, you know, I talked about creating emotional impact or behavior. Um, this was up in Algonquin Park and out on uh on um Cameron island and there's just so much going on you know and and focusing in and really trying to find a behavior that's going to work and and you don't necessarily know how it's all going to come together but when you're looking at incoming birds you know and how are the reactions going to be from the birds that are are on the nest and i was really really happy with this image and the results i think there's just so much more of a story here than just one comrade in in flight and waiting it out you know waiting it out until you know you you can't any longer and and you it's no longer safe to be on the water uh using the light the backlight the the beautiful setting sun to highlight the the comrade nests always looking at ways that you can uh, focus in more try to create a little bit more story how do you use that light to uh, and your background again your background 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 to um to enhance your your subjects and how to work all those elements together so you're not only working your technical aspects in your uh your composition but how your light is going to work with you so it's it's just this constant evolving process that i think that's why we need to be shooting all the time in order for us to put all those elements together and just anticipating waiting and positioning yourself so you're going to have the best light possible with these with these uh, um, birds that are in flight going in flight hope they're going in flight whatever it is maybe they're feeding um, again taking chances and and you know I could have been on the other side where it was lit um, the side light uh, from the other side but I decided to use the backlight for this swan taking off and sometimes the behavior happens, of course, when you're you know, you're least expected or that you don't necessarily, you can't change your position, but it's happening in front of you. And sometimes magic happens and the light is right and the, the behavior is right and everything comes together. But with bird photography, we all know that it takes a whole lot of time uh, and wildlife in general, you know, to, to create these beautiful magical moments and going out in elements that you wouldn't necessarily go in um and you know there's you have to be safe and being protected all the time of course is is hugely important again just those that that behavior that emotion that i think we can all connect to um you know is what i'm always trying to achieve and it doesn't and sometimes it's parts of the elements of the image it's not necessarily having you know the entire adult swan in but it's a focus in on on the signets and part of of the parent so yeah again uh snowy just on the side of the road in the in snow um you know just finding these beautiful creatures uh, I don't know, there's just something magical being able to photograph owls and, and other uh, critters in, in the snow. I think it, it adds to the, to the image as well. So this is uh, done in Algonquin Park. And I mean, this just blows my mind even when I think about it. We, it was setting sun, so there was no sunlight. It, the sun was going right down. Found this owl, it was a perfect perch. The, the light was actually beautiful on it. Like the whole scene was incredible. So got out, he wasn't hunting, he was just kind of perched and he was probably roosting for the night. And uh, so I was shooting with the 500 and I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna put on the two times and I'm gonna push it and see what what I can create. And I mean, these are numbers that I never even imagined saying, and I'm sure all of you are the same. Like, I mean, how how is it possible that, you know, you can get, um, let me just see here. Where are my numbers? There we are. These are numbers that I, you know, I never imagined seeing, you know, or using like ISO 4000, one sixtieth of a 
a second at f11 and i'm hand holding a 500 at two times so i'm hand holding a thousand millimeters at one one sixtieth of a second i mean seriously when would you ever imagine using those kinds of numbers? So always pushing the boundaries what you think you have with your camera and seeing how far you can take it is is especially with the new systems and the new mirrorless. It just is, it's mind blowing um, the the numbers that you're getting. There's a northern hawk owl. Um, it, this is a bird. I've never. This was my first time photographing a bird. Uh, chick owlet. Sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, just watching the behavior with mom and if she was hunting and came over and tried to, you know, move the uh, the owlet along, um, you know, they forced them to to jump uh, in order to spread their wings and get them to, to fly. Um, yeah, so it was really another really cool aspect of being in Ottawa and going out and photographing these uh, uh, birds that I had never photographed or seen before. Typically, I'm in other places of, of the world photographing at this time of year, so super cool. And, you know, sometimes a bird feeder works. You know, you can go to a bird feeder where, you know, these evening gross beaks were, they were flying into the tree, it wasn't working for me, so I just... I, I decided to focus right on the bird feeder. And then I knew that there was interaction going on. So it was like, okay, so cut out a little bit of the bird feeder, but that's where I was getting the most. And typically I'm always looking away from the bird feeder, but you know, this is where it really came in handy to focus on on the birds and capturing um, this interaction. And I couldn't get it in, in the trees. Even in my backyard, Scott goes, you know, I got my husband and son who are always looking out for me. And, and Scott said, there's two morning doves on our bird feeder, bird feeder. And I actually had the sepia filter on from the studio. And uh, so I didn't have time to change it. And I actually loved the, the how it looked with these, these this couple of, of uh, morning doves that were there for a short while. I almost felt like my parents came over to say hello and uh, allowed me to photograph them. And then they were gone and never saw them again. So this is a blue heron. Uh, I'm just gonna end with this story, um, the rookery that I've been spending time with and I went to, while they were nesting, oh, you know, in May we had this crazy snowstorm. So, you know, if I was lucky enough to visit there um, when it was snowing and when it was raining, but to see this behavior was so cool when the chicks were born and to watch the, the parents feed when the chicks were really young, um, that interaction and how the incoming um, uh, heron would, would squawk and then the one that was on the nest would lift its head right up in the air like this. And then they would do this little dance and the, the heron would land a little bit further up and it would make its way down. And then this interaction that was happening between the two parents, all their feathers went out and then they would go nose to nose or beak to beak. And it was almost like they were maybe... I, in my interpretation, it was like she was making sure that he had food or vice versa. I don't know if it was male or the female, but it was like they regurgitate for their chicks. So it was like, were they smelling to make sure that there was food in the mouth? And then, uh, and then this one heron would just like pat it on the back with one wing and then it would fly off. It was incredible, incredible. One morning I went out, it was raining. I was like, yeah, it's raining. I'm going to go to the heronry and the rookery. And uh, I showed up and there were two egrets and there were two egrets on this limb. I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so this was taken with the 800 with the two times extender from my car with the, with the bean bag. And I was just so thrilled. And, and whatever the male would do uh, or whatever the female would do, the male would do. And, um, and then they flew off and uh, they flew right under the um, heron nest and they were very inquisitive. So you could see the herons up in the left hand corner, the, the chicks, and they weren't moving. Like they just had, first of all, they were hungered down because of the rain, but when they knew that these egrets were around, they didn't move. So then uh, the whole story was, you know, that the egret went over and he peeked his head into, into the nest. They never moved and then and then the egret flew off and then they flew into the marsh and they started to feed and oh, it was just it was amazing it was like i hit the jackpot you know and i think we all feel like that when we have these experiences so it was really cool and and of course i've not seen the egrets uh, since but i have seen these chicks grow i've seen them kill their siblings i have seen them violently feed as they get older and older um it's incredible to watch this was just the other day 
So almost full size and the parent is coming back to regurgitate again. And the violent behavior is, is crazy to watch how, how the chicks are feeding off of the parent. And of course their numbers are diminishing. And uh, you can see it here. I mean, their beak is right around the, the neck. It, it's incredible. So I try to go in all times of the day. I try to go when it's raining, but also in the early morning hours, the late day hours. And uh, sometimes when I don't even have the choice, I just go right in the middle of the day. And, and sometimes I have huge success and sometimes I don't. But this was just the other day. So there were three chicks in this nest and now there's one and there is one hanging. So sometimes the story like the, the dead loon isn't a pretty one, but it's part of nature and important for us to, to share those stories and to you know share this behavior out of interest, out of blending the art and science and you know, making people more aware of what we have to lose if, you know, we don't protect or take care of our, our planet. That's the way that I like to, to think about it. Uh, this is a, this is a, from, again, just the other morning, I went out before sunrise and some pretty cool light that was happening in the background. And this is the, the chick growing. So um, I suspect when I go back that they'll be maybe completely out of the nest and not coming back to feed. It'll be interesting to see every time I go. It's a different, uh, a different behavior, a different sign, a different uh, population. So, and then when I'm waiting for the parent to come back, I sometimes have other visitors. So I will lots and lots of red-winged blackbirds and um, uh, all kinds of Baltimore Orioles and all kinds of things, ducks, wood ducks, and mallards, and we even had a trumpeter swan in the in the pond. So pretty cool to to focus on a few other um, birds that are around and just to hear you know all the sounds of the of the birds is incredible too so and then I found this follow tree and it was right in front of me the whole time and there were three babies coming out uh, so then I just it became my mission to to capture this forget the herons <laughs> squirrel you know back to back to the swallows and and how the swallow would come back and feed the feed the chicks um, uh, dragonflies and then to watch the one on the left the one that has the mouth open it's a little piggy he was the one getting all the food all the time so i uh, got some slow motion really cool slow motion of this as well so really really fun to explore see uh expand you know uh your focus modes you know test your camera out be mindful of all of these elements that are are available to us play with picture filters um you know and the most important thing is, you know, if you haven't shot video yet, maybe maybe try that out and uh, have fun, explore, make mistakes because you're going to make a ton of them and be really, really patient and just watch. And one of the other, the last thing I'll leave you with, you know, is, is um, probably going to the same place over and over again, what you see, the differences that you see in not only the behavior of the animals that or the birds that you're photographing, but what else happens, like even on this tree right after, I had pileated woodpecker come with her two her two chicks, and she was still feeding them, but they were learning how to dig for their for their um, their food as well. So you you just be mindful, be uh, pay attention, and be observant, and really see. Don't just look and uh, and watch for some really cool stuff to unfold in front of you, and know that if you're not successful one day, you'll be successful the next. So I'll leave you with this um, little video compilation that I did. Just I wanted to share some of the beautiful images of birds that I've been able to capture. And you'll see this guy um, in slow motion coming to feed. And I hope you enjoy it. And happy to answer any questions that you might have. Enjoy your bird photography. And I'm sure we'll see you again. And thanks for tuning into this inspired series. And thank you to Nikon for having me. <laughs>